So welcome and good evening to the fifth evening lecture of the Graz Utopia um, project. Um, we are broadcasting now uh, live from Forum Stadtpark in Graz. Um, and uh, we're having two guests in this evening, uh, Anna Jokic and Mark Nehlen, aka Stealth Unlimited. Welcome and hello. Now they are uh, joining us from abroad. Uh, Stealth Unlimited are trained as architects or uh, educated as architects, yet they work rather also in the fields of contemporary arts and cultures and uh, science, and they collaborate wildly and widely uh, between various fields such as urban research or visual arts or cultural activism. And they um, uh, their, their practice involves uh, spatial interventions, which they do often, but also they develop speculative thought and they like tinkering of uh, shared futures and utopias, which apparently makes them really interesting for our utopian projects here. Uh, their dissertation, which they did together and published in 2018 at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, was called Upscaling, Training and Commoning. And now for many years, they work with participative urban projects, both in Belgrade and in Rotterdam, very internationally. Um, and uh, well, they're also asking questions on the politics of housing, which I guess is a really good, how to say, continuation of the talk we had yesterday with Gabo Heindl, who also talked a lot about the housing questions. And you try to formulate utopian ideas about uh, how to live together in cities. Um, I will now give words to our two guests and uh, they will talk for a while and then also the audience will have the possibility to ask questions so you can have in mind uh, what is really interesting for you. Also, we can, we can deepen the discussion later. Yeah, so I would give words to Anna and Mark and I'm really um, looking forward to what they have to say. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see live audience uh, in a space. Uh, this is new for us, <laughs> at least in this relationship of a Zoom and the live meeting. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. We're really glad that we could take part in, part in such an interesting program. We will uh, try to connect uh, two aspects of our work in this talk tonight. One is the fiction and the uh, utopian, let's say, part. And uh, the other is a practice of developing a new approach to cooperative housing in Belgrade and in the, let's say, wider region around Belgrade with its specificities and limitations. So Mark will start. And can you share the uh, yes, PowerPoint? Yes, just share the presentation. I hope it works. We can see it. We can see it well. Okay. Great. <laughs> Excellent. So as Anna already introduced, key part of our talk today is about a new wave of housing co-ops or community-led housing initiatives, actually in the central and southeastern uh, European region, a little bit east from where you are at the moment, I should say. Um, obvious part of that are the challenges you have to mount, the struggle to arrive at such a reality, especially in, in the context where we are now here uh, in, in Belgrade. We don't have any of these uh, examples uh, around us right now, so it's it, that's uh, it's really an, a novelty to uh, to be able to bring these things here. But for a start, we'll take it to an occasion where we have been to some degree forecasting, exploring, uh, maybe even provoking to some degree those community-led initiatives as a future reality. As you see. The year is 2011. That was the year of Occupy Wall Street that outburst against inequality, against greed, corruption, middle of Arab Spring. But it's also the year in which, for instance, a city like Bordeaux has launched its vision for the future. A true metropolis, an urban boom. That's what uh, the mayor said of it. And the aim to reach one million people. 
And city officials were looking to, let's say, the, the usual large scale development projects to reach that goal, uh, to reach this big bang, to reach this one million uh, people in the city. What we were interested in, or what we decided to, uh, to do, is to, to challenge that urban ambition of the city, that big bang that they were dreaming about. And we looked at all the small banks that groups of citizens were setting up instead to make the city to something that would be good for them and not just for real estate speculators. Maybe just to add, the occasion to do so was in an urban biennial. Uh, organized in that year, and we have been invited to do one of the large scale exhibitions in collaboration with the Architecture Center Arc and Rev, looking at the future of the present, but present moment, but also future of the city. So to look at this, uh, all these small banks for a couple of months, we crossed the city to find groups and collectives that mainly carried by their own need and their own drive display new forms of collective organization, uh, weave new forms of solidarity. And we came across a number of citizens' initiatives, uh, citizens initiatives that either were not satisfied with the prospect of market-driven solutions to, for instance, housing demand, or were lacking affordable and collective workspace or other spaces in the city, and started to practice alternative approaches driven by them, driven by them themselves. And here you have one of these groups, Bobo Yaka. It's a group that wants to spend their senior age, not as lone individuals, but living in a mutual support community. Uh, they quite literally told us they, they would like to live and die together. And they were excited about that, but they were also a bit intimidated by their own plans, common house, sharing, and, and how would that work after 40 or 50 years living on their own, now suddenly doing things together? Would that work? How would they get there? And we met also another group, uh, Ashnor, for instance, of uh, 40 individuals and families from, from very different social and economic backgrounds. They formed in 2006. And their main principles are to construct non-for-profit housing with environmental awareness and social cohesion, but close to the city center because they were feeling that they were slowly driven out of the city to the, to the edge of the city, that there was basically no place for them anymore in the city. And that was where they wanted to be. Well, there are many things which uh, could be said about their, uh, uh, their plans. Um, it, it is a very uh, uh, in integral uh, setup, uh, not only housing, uh, there was also uh, their own productive garden, community spaces inside of it. It's an interesting, uh, an interesting setup. But the key thing which uh, struck us was their concept to basically uh, fix the price of, uh, of, of the apartments and turn housing into a non-commodity, something which could not be speculated with. So which would be for the first ones who would enter their, uh, their, their housing community, basically the same level of affordability as for someone who would come after 10 or 20 years. Now, maybe just a little bit here. Now, what was uh, interesting uh, for us at that point may, might have become a common knowledge. Meanwhile, 10 years ago, these were sort of novel ideas, things that we would get surprised and, uh, and stricken by or get inspired uh, with. But uh, what uh, made us really tick at this point in 2011 was when we uh, spent uh, a number of months in the city of Bordeaux uh, and we decided to actually make a future fiction based on the stories uh, that we have heard and people that we have met. And once the drivers and the energies of these initiatives in our mind started to be put together, even though many of them are still in an embryonic stage in front of us or in front of anyone willing to see a new uh, not yet accounted for city would start to emerge driven by numerous collectives and start to take shape. So could this, our question was, could this be a base to, propose, to propel us into a possible Bordeaux of 2030? We came up with a quite a different scenario from the one in the beginning where the city is driven by a big uh, large scale developments uh, done by big corporations. And uh, we made a story which was called Once Upon a Future, 
which used the fictional narrative as a, as a tool uh, and we co uh, wrote it in collaboration with philosopher and writer Bruce Bego and a young architect from Pula from Croatia, Emil Urzan. And the whole story got illustrated by a dozen of graphic and comic artists from the city itself. And as you can see here, the site was uh, outdoors on one of these locations that were uh, supposed to be turned and meanwhile actually have been turned into a quite like a large uh, development on the riverbank. For this fictional account of the future, the, st the strategic agenda of the city has been taken as a base, but given shape through the motives, tools, and activities of groups of citizens that already today explore a different collective peer uh, production of the city by setting up an urban economy through productive clusters to achieve a more resilient, more sustainable development. Or commonly looking for different forms of living and making housing in speculation defined ways they oppose individualism and competition and instead practice mutualization and common ownership or management of resources. Despite its fictionality, the story often intentionally borders the reality and thus points that a different future is not unthinkable nor unrealizable. On this city, on this city, on this image, you see uh, at that time, mayor of Bordeaux, uh, Alain Juppé, he was at that time also minister of foreign affairs uh, of uh, France and uh, Bruce Begaud, the author with whom he wrote the story is actually trying to convince him that a different future is possible. At that point, he considered that uh, the crisis, the financial crisis that was the core of the story that we built was the, would be the last crisis we would face. That point uh, in Bordeaux and the story that we made there was uh, crucial for us as, and was one of the triggers to start working in a, in a different direction. Uh, we have been until that point quite active in uh, exhibition making, in research that would end up in uh, publications, but also the uh, be staying in Bordeaux and spending, spending considerable amount of time there. It was nine months that we invested our lives and at that point we're supposed to leave the city and actually since then never came back, made us think what is that that uh, we would like to do with this knowledge further on. And uh, this became a, a topic for us in, and, and resulted also in a publication of Scaling Training Commoning, which was a part of our PhD uh, that we did in Stockholm. But the most interesting part of this uh, PhD process was actually to use our own practice uh, as a practice-based research and shape a different direction for ourselves, the direction in which we would like to de develop for a quite a long uh, further. And the story is takes a period from 2008 until 2018, the 10-year period from the start of, of global financial crisis and our own transformation during this period. And we will now take you into one fragment of this development which will uh, look uh, specifically at uh, our engagement with the housing in the context of Serbia, of Belgrade, but also the wider region. And we'll start with uh, the wider region and where we are, uh, what we are active with at, uh, today. So as we said in the beginning, it's about uh, a wave of novel housing cooperatives in Central and Southeastern Europe. Um, in particular, at the moment, uh, it's in, uh, in five cities in Belgrade, Budapest, Ljubljana, Prague and Zagreb. And this is us in 2019, uh, the first, uh, let's say, birthday of, uh, of a sort of network, uh, informal network uh, of, uh, of pioneering housing initiatives, which um, somehow found out that, that there is a lot of, uh, in common in, in the things that you would like to achieve, but also in the, in the struggles we are at the moment going through. Maybe I can tell a little bit about what's the issue of housing actually at the moment here. So in the central and southeastern European region, uh, housing provision is market-led, and I must say it's also mainly, uh, um, it's like uh, uh, privately owned housing. 
sometimes 95% um, uh, owned housing. So there's very small... Uh, sometimes 99%. 99, yes. Uh, so there's a very small segment of public housing or uh, rental housing. So let's say buying your uh, house or your apartment is basically the only way or the yeah it's the only reality to get to uh, to housing with this public housing of one to five percent you can imagine that it's not really a sort of a support network for those who cannot uh, afford to uh, uh, to to buy their own property so there is like uh, there's really a clash uh, private rental is either non-existing or highly unregulated so it's like uh, it's like um, you, you cannot really trust it. Uh, often there are no contracts. It's, uh, it's, it's very problematic. And for anything else outside of this, there is a lack of legal and financial frameworks to, you know, like to develop alternatives. So it's not an easy situation. And to, um, to illustrate this, uh, here we have um, a graph. Probably you cannot really read it, but I can, I can give you some insights on it. Uh, it shows basically... Um, the affordability of, uh, um, of, of let's say, occupant-owned uh, housing uh, in this uh, in this region, and you see that for May and for a lot of these uh, these countries, it will take you um, often up to eight, nine, ten, eleven uh, full uh, gross salaries to uh, to Year, buy yearly. yearly salaries. Yes, to buy an uh, buy an apartment. So that has a huge impact on the available household income. And as you might know, in this region, the um, uh, the, the average salaries are rather uh, rather low. So this prevent, presents an, uh, an actual um, incompatibility. I actually see that Austria has also is the third. Serbia is eleven point three, and Austria is ten. But the salaries are different there. <laughs> Um, and this graph is also interesting. It shows basically the price development uh, of housing. Uh, if you compare the Euro 15 countries with the, let's say, the region we are speaking about, you see there is a growing gap between, uh, between the Euro 15 and those countries uh, which we are at the moment focusing on. So despite the already, uh, let's say, uh, tricky situation here, the, the price of housing is getting up and uh, compar comparatively to the rest of Europe uh, in, in, in a much more uh, dramatic way. So that's not a good sign. And finally, this last graph here shows the, the mix of, uh, of ownership. Uh, on the left side, you see the Euro 15 average. And you see there is quite a bit of different forms of, uh, of housing, uh, occupancy, ownership, use, uh, rental, stuff like that. But in many of the other countries which we are speaking about, it's a very uh, mono mix. Uh, so that means there are no many uh, alternatives available as the, the dominant form, which is buying your own apartment, doesn't work for you. And that's what we are at the moment focusing on. So we have started this uh, network, which is called MOBA. MOBA in Serbian well, Croatian language stands for uh, mobilization, collective mobilization to do a, a work, which is, it was usually before in a village, like to finish a house or to harvest a field where no one is basically paid for, but in turn, you help each other to accomplish what has to be done. And this name MOBA has been uh, important and, and kind of binding us together to help uh, develop these new innovative forms of affordable housing uh, across the region that we are speaking about. And what we are speaking about is cooperatively owned, uh, limited equity-based uh, rental housing uh, which, uh, yeah, would long-term be used by people that would live in the apartments. Uh, MOBA promotes a model with following values. Uh, one, the first one, of course, is affordability, uh, then uh, no individual ownership, which is, as we saw, uh, something which is uh, uh, difficult also to persuade people to, because all the state policy is uh, gearing in the direction of, of, of private ownership or actually lack of state policy is gearing toward uh, private ownership, uh, but also no uh, individual financial risk is that this model is bringing with itself economic participation of members, 
by uh, co-investing, but in a smaller, let's say, percentages levels. Uh, membership control, uh, that the model is replicable and all the members are working on, on this and keeping buildings out of the market or actually anti-speculation. The four, five pilot projects uh, which are uh, in preparation or actually some of them have been accomplished, like the smallest one here in Budapest is in use already for a while. Uh, all target at the six, average 60% of a market uh, prices rental and all together are 108 um, housing units or housing ha households. So as you can see, we are a, a small group of, uh, and our pilot projects cover about 250 people across five different cities. But uh, there is actually a much greater potential for uh, the housing model we are speaking about, and we estimate that it is about two and a half million people in these countries that are in need of an alternative and that this that this uh, could work for, and all together about seven and a half million people which are in need for a different uh, affordable ways of housing. In Serbia, 72% of population has significant difficulty to cover housing related costs like utilities. And uh, we have uh, in 2010 already started an organization which is called Who Builds the City or Co Gradi Grad. And uh, one of the activities that we, uh, with quite a bit of focus on housing and specifically developing this new model of housing. In 2016, as a part of a campaign which was called Welcome to the Housing Hell, we made a, a, a series of uh, billboards uh, which were addressing actually the lack of, of, of solutions. And one of them was this one saying, you don't have an apartment. Uh, there is guaranteed housing solution with a uh, yeah, prison cell peeping behind this door. Um, some years before the, the launch of that campaign, actually, we started uh, another process which is ongoing, and uh, that is to disassemble the housing issue or the way of seeing how housing should be resolved and uh, to reassemble a new housing approach possibly at a third of a market price. And this was a call that we have launched uh, to uh, invite people actually to start to work with us together in developing this model. At that point, uh, we had uh, no uh, uh, legal form or uh, uh, really direction to, uh, exact direction to take. We knew some examples as the ones that you heard uh, from Bordeaux and a number of others that we have read about or maybe have visited, but that was about it. Uh, about 30 to 40 people joined this, core, uh, uh, joined this call and we have spent about two years to shape together an approach that we would like uh, to uh, develop together. Um, it centers around the cooperative of inhabitants jointly becoming co-initiators, co-designers, co-finers and co-builders as uh, it self-manages the entire trajectory and does not need to make a profit, the resulting flats are much more affordable and the pressure is taken away from individuals uh, through the process a community is being built up. Um, as I said in the beginning, we had no prescribed uh, legal form that we would be working with, but the cooperative uh, ownership and co cooperative way of organizing became emerged, let's say, through this process. So the cooperative owns the real estate and takes on the prime loans to pay for its construction, uh, participating households as collectively own their building and keep it there because individual members cannot speculate with their flat. In that way, it remains affordable for next generations of its inhabitants. So what is important here, they become co-initiators, co-designers, co-financers, and co-builders. Now, cooperatives is nothing uh, really new, but when we wanted to start up a cooperative in Belgrade, we quite quickly figured out that there was a gap of almost 20 years. So for 20 years, there had been, uh, not been established new housing cooperatives uh, in the city. And that, of course, uh, are the, the, you know, the, 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 
the 20 years in which uh, much of the the change from uh, you know like from the, the the Yugoslav society to where we are now has been taking place and that gap then also means that in the meantime a lot of the legal uh, framework has changed uh, the whole way of uh, you know financing has changed the whole banking world has changed so when we uh, when we went to set up a housing cooperative and we started to speak with the lawyers and the notaries about it they were really puzzled what is this actually what we want to do and how should it be working and where should it be uh, where should it be registered so that was um, uh, pretty much a learning by doing uh, exercise, but it was very, um, very uh, important for us to uh, to get this uh, to get this going. Along that, there were a lot of other things which we had to figure out. So, for instance, how does uh, collective ownership, mutual home home ownership? fit within the new set of, um, uh, of uh, laws and regulations uh, in the post-Yugoslav era. Uh, lawyers which we, again, which we contacted uh, were, uh, were uh, intrigued but puzzled with this, uh, with this question. There is no current uh, experience with that. We had basically had to build this knowledge and, and expertise and we've been lucky to um, uh, to 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 work or to to get funding for uh, for several uh, legal studies in this field because it's it's really not easy to uh, to figure this out. Funnily enough, from German government. <laughs> Another thing which we started to look at is. Um, if we can make housing, which is not only uh, affordable, but uh, can it be also somehow uh, in line with what we expect from housing today in terms of environmental uh, standards? And can that also be made affordable? Because that was a, a huge challenge. So we've been working with, uh, with a team of engineers to figure out these details we thought that it's very important to have some sort of uh, to have some sort of like understanding of this before we start working with uh, with communities of people who want to get into this new adventure to understand you know like uh, what can they do uh, to have basically part of that uh, ground prepared for them one of the things we did for that was to uh, to make a sort of a reference design to understand how a novel form of cooperative uh, could work, you know, like the combination of private and collective spaces, other functions which you would add to these buildings. Well, being in Austria, you understand how these things work. But here in Belgrade, this was quite a new territory to discover. And then, of course, the, the whole idea of, um, uh, of what it is uh, a cooperative. And it was interesting to read, for instance, this, um, uh, this command of uh, Paul Chatterton on uh, the Lilac Leeds co-housing project. So he says, we're, we're a financial cooperative first and foremost. And that's a real stand against this corrosive individualism we've seen through the housing market and the housing bubbles over the last few years. So it's also uh, important to understand that a cooperative is an economic entity uh, in the hands and run, uh, operated by, uh, by the members. And that means that uh, these members also should get a certain level of, um, of expertise in how to do that or of family, family, uh, being familiar with it. Uh, for that, we developed a tool which helps, open source tool, which helps uh, communities who want to enter this, uh, uh, this adventure to understand basically um, how they can structure their project, how they can uh, test the sort of economic viability of it, how they can understand, you know, like for the first, uh, maybe for, the, for a period of 30 years, how such a project would, uh, would perform. Um, because it's, of course, it's, uh, it's important that it's affordable in the beginning, but you really want to understand whether it's affordable to live there, whether it gives you a sort of a sustainable economic situation. And for a lot of groups which we, uh, or for the groups which we, uh, we met, this was like a huge puzzle. Like, how do you know this? How do you assess that? So for that, we built uh, an open source tool to do that. In this in this talk, in this part, we are not uh, speaking where we stand now and uh, what is the current situation with the cooperative 
maybe we can take that up in the in the questions but what we wanted to finish our presentation with is uh, uh, exactly on this side of the financial tool because one of the things that make these new forms of uh, housing possible are the new also ways of financing uh, institutions that believe in different ways of organizing and support them also financially. So as I said in the beginning, uh, uh, the, or as we said in the beginning that uh, MOBA members are all facing very similar issues. Uh, they are one of the key issues that we are facing is that uh, that we would like that we don't have these financial mechanisms and that we would like to establish anti-speculative financial mechanisms uh, on an international scale that would give support to sharing this uh, experience which we have in mutual learning. And uh, what has happened from an informal organization which started somewhere uh, on uh, edges of a, of a meeting of collaborative housing in Berlin in 2017, grew mean meanwhile in a European Cooperative Society. European Cooperative Society is a, a legal form uh, which exists in uh, Euro European Union, uh, which uh, makes exactly these international connections uh, possible uh, in a formal way, um, yeah, across the borders. So we had our uh, founding assembly in Zagreb uh, in last year, just when, uh, when the COVID crisis uh, was to hit. And this was our really last uh, live meeting uh, ever since, since that time. And uh, yeah, we managed to just uh, pass under the radar and uh, establish uh, the organization. Um, here are listed uh, some of the goals of MOBA. I'm not going to go into details. But uh, one, just read these blue things, uh, the technical support to the groups that are for the first time starting something also with these tools that we have been mentioning, like the calculation tool, the financial support uh, through mobile fund that we will see in the end of this presentation, then to be a political uh, voice and uh, have advocacy also towards other bodies uh, and particularly European Union and uh, 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 putting uh, ahead, let's say, the situation in which we are uh, in this region, which is very specific and different from the, let's say, more uh, uh, Western uh, and more like financially stronger part of Europe, uh, scaling up, uh, opening new financial uh, channels. And uh, the last thing, this is not in particular or order, uh, the last thing is developing a MOBA standard, which is basically that all of our projects aligned to the same uh, principles and we together develop, uh, let's say, uh, a framework in which we like uh, and feel okay to function. So MOBA uh, is, is, uh, is, an in, is basically an intermediary which connects uh, projects on the ground, uh, like the five ones which we mentioned previously, uh, has an intention to develop national umbrella organizations that would link uh, also to MOBA, but in particular to connect with, to partners and uh, financial institutions. And uh, as the last slide, uh, we have here um, put a MOBA fund, which we think is an interesting uh, tool and mechanism, which make it, which we hope makes utopia towards reality. So uh, the fund has been launched uh, just uh, last month. Uh, with a very tiny uh, bit of, of uh, contribution from ABZ, the largest uh, cooperative housing uh, organization from, uh, from Zurich. And uh, the idea that is that this fund actually uh, creates a different uh, ways of financing for a newly starting uh, housing cooperatives in our part of Europe. Um, and for the beginning, this would be uh, refundable uh, loans that projects are getting uh, to start, uh, yeah, to, to let's say from the friendly source of finance uh, at the point when there are no other sources yet available and maybe with that then open doors for next possibilities. So we would like to finish with this and uh, open for your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
uh, for for the talk and for the really pioneering work you're doing um i think it's great also to include this uh well to say um eastern central eastern european perspective also in in the discourse when we talk about these things uh is there is there a question to the two people in, from the audience at the moment otherwise I'd, i'd like to hear um i think a little bit more about the about the you have, you've been talking a lot about the concrete projects and the concrete steps and pioneering um 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 yeah uh, adventures but um could you uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about the about the about the utopia that is like behind it what's like the the what's what's the long term perspective of uh, of this endeavor is it like I, I, should should like all people then live in cooperative housing projects or uh Or or, or 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 like a totally different system, or like what what is how are your thoughts on 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 the on on this thing? Maybe we have different parts of the answer. <laughs> uh, maybe I can start. Um, in this, uh, I'm not going to talk about the concrete projects, but I'm going to talk about this story from the beginning from Bordeaux. Uh, the story there is a, a build on. Um, As we said, it was built on a 2030 vision. So, uh, so it was 2011, 2030 was almost 20 years ahead. And uh, what we were uh, uh, looking at as at the start of this process was the city project program, let's say city agenda. It was a big document, A3 size, uh, thick like this, which was outlining what the uh, vision of the city for these 20 years would be. And uh, as, as I said, uh, as we said, we went uh, into the city and we were not interested in these big players, let's say how they would formulate this agenda, but it's the small players of what were they doing on the ground and was this finding any place in this agenda. And as we saw, there was no actually place for them. They were just some marginal actors happening there. And our position was how could they get a central point? How could, and maybe the crisis in which we are actually now, or also even the crisis of the fact that, for instance, in Belgrade, only 5% are people are buying uh, properties at all or have a capacity to do that, brings us to really to this uh, situation that uh, that, uh, that that other people, that this, let's say small scale people and initiatives have to find the central place in the city agendas. So, so we uh, took that document and we started chapter by chapter to come through and start to rewrite the story of the or the content of the city agenda from the perspective of these groups that we met on the ground and how would the city look like. And in this story, there is, a, let's say, there is a nice and beautiful sign, side, but there is also a lot of a confrontation, not just with the authorities, not just with the big players, but also, let's say, with people who don't uh, agree with this or don't want to be, as you say, don't want to be part of cooperatives. So we were very much aware that this, that this is not, let's the one form of organizing but that these are the drivers for the change. And we were looking for these drivers of change and potentially imagining how they could work further. And then as the story develops, you see that uh, in different aspects, like for instance, in the housing, in uh, something that we would previously call a public space, but maybe becomes more like a commons, different forms also of managing space and organizing are becoming possible. And in the story, uh, the final, one of the final chapters is the, the, uh, dedicated to the politics of the city. And uh, this was much earlier than municipalism and the uh, things that we see now in practice in Bordeaux, for instance, uh, not in Bordeaux, sorry, in Barcelona, for instance, or maybe uh, Zagreb of today, where uh, Mojima, where a new political option came to power. And in our view, 2030 was the year when uh, there is a new kind of elections being called up. And uh, the, the, there is uh, much more this, let's say, delegated democracy in which in some way in, uh, by a lot people take uh, part in participating in decision-making and governing the city. And that this would uh, 
let's say, be a turn of, of, of uh, direction. And uh, what was interesting after this exhibition, there was like a small review in a Croatian actually a web portal and the title was Better Future Only in 2030. <laughs> so, so this was an interesting, uh, like a interesting comment in a way that, it's, uh, that we need from these kind of small seats of what we saw as seats about, uh, we thought about 20 years actually to reach that. And maybe we are now somewhere indeed halfway uh, uh, to that in some context, of course. Uh, maybe here in Belgrade is, is, is we are in some way uh, later than, uh, than that. But I think that what is happening, for instance, in Zagreb or what is happening in Barcelona might take us by 2030 to a different city. So, yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, I have a question um, regarding those uh, housing communities. How do the people mobilize? How do people find each other to create these communities? And are there any restrictions regarding, for example, migrants or income? How does it work? Yes. yes. Um, it's interesting. So I, I come actually from the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands um, there are plenty full of such uh, such examples. So we know about them. We know where to find them in the city. If you go to Amsterdam, it's full of this sort of stuff. Um, and what we have uh, in in let's say in the region where uh, where I'm now uh, is that we don't see these examples. So it's very difficult actually for communities to even imagine uh, how something like this uh, could be possible. Um, what we thought in the beginning is that we would basically have to compile such communities somehow, you know, by talking about it, uh, showing these examples, getting people uh, interested in that. And um, this has been, uh, for a long while, it has been basically our, um, uh, at least in Belgium, it has been our, um, our, our route to take. But to our surprise, we were actually, in the beginning of, uh, of this year, we were uh, contacted by, uh, by a community. Um, of um, it, it's an intergenerational community, but largely uh, still a group, not yeah, a community. <laughs> group, yeah, of I, I would say largely senior people who started to understand that uh, maybe they have to secure a sort of uh, environment in which you know, with their shrinking pensions, they can see a future without being you know afraid that at some point they will just simply run out. Uh, that they have to have some sort of environment which would take care, the literal care of them in the, in the older age, uh, which would also prevent them from uh, getting isolated, maybe uh, even lonely. So instead of us uh, pushing, they came to us and they said, oh, we heard you're doing something with this. Can you, can you help us? And then after that, a second group uh, came. They've also been, uh, they have been for a while, they've been working around, uh, uh, you know, activities with the school in a certain neighborhood and started to understand that maybe for them, it would be also important to, in, to, to set up, to create a different sort of living environment. So at the moment, um, um, we, we are getting um, groups of people who are interested in this. And what we try now to do with them is to uh, to help them to become a sort of like, or to imagine how they can back become a sort of a housing community, because it's like it's not so obvious how you how you do that. Um, as far as I understand, there are no restrictions uh, of the type you mentioned, you know, like of uh, per, per se of, of income or of, uh, of uh, you know, like uh, migrant status or things like that. Uh, but that is maybe also a little bit uh, particular uh, situation uh, here um, because we have pretty much of a mono uh, culture. So, you know, it's it's maybe not uh, so big of a trick uh, in that sense. But if we speak uh, realistically, uh, of course, there is, a, there is really a limit, for instance, uh, um, there is a limit to, you know, like what sort of people can carry such projects because um, it, 
cooperative housing always requires some form of participation of members. So that means that you have to have some, uh, some finances uh, available for that. For some groups in society, that's uh, more tricky. Um, I can, for instance, think about uh, younger people uh, with, you know, like often very unstable uh, income uh, situations, you know, how they are uh, becoming part of this. That's uh, still a huge uh, challenge. And of course, we are here in an environment where the average income is already low. So let's say uh, the, the challenge to, let's say, to buy in into such a project, even if it's affordable and friendly, is a real uh, challenge. And that said, uh, um, obviously, these forms of uh, uh, community-driven um, cooperative housing uh, are a segment of the housing which would be available there. And there's definitely also a need for uh, public housing, uh, especially for those people who, you know, who really can't afford this and for which uh, this cooperative housing also cannot uh, realistically present an alternative. For us, it's a challenge to get these first projects going. Uh, we also uh, know that there are uh, uh, such uh, housing communities, uh, not here, but for instance, in the UK, which built in buffering mechanism, which allow for a much wider variety of incomes to, uh, to participate, or which help people uh, who are living in these, uh, in these housing projects and have, for instance, uh, issues with their income, you know, like you lose your job, uh, you know, what then, you know, are you suddenly not welcome anymore in our community? Some of them are even going that far that they base the rent on a, uh, on a, on a ratio of the income. Uh, we are still very far from such, uh, let's say, advanced uh, levels of, uh, you know, of, of organizing, but definitely we, you know, like uh, it is something which we on the longer term would, um, would, would like to integrate in this that you know because for us it's about building a sort of sustainable housing situations um, so this sort of buffering this sort of like uh, mutual solidarity should also be part of that but this is probably something which we will have to bring in in a little bit later stage <clears throat> Uh, when you show the uh, financial system of your project, uh, I hope I understood so far. Uh, is it a little bit uh, similar maybe to the, like the system of the Habitat uh, Collective in Germany? Uh, it, they buy, for example, houses uh, from the free market and uh, so they take it away from the capitalistic market and mostly the houses in the end are also com uh, organized like a community and and with the money they make with these houses they uh, buy the next houses and this is a non-profit organization and in the end, the rent should be uh, or they should get cheaper when they, for example, uh, they, when, they, when, when the bills are paid of the house or so. Yes, exactly. Um, this sort of networks, like also the Mietshäuser Syndicate, I, that might be the one, uh, are, um, are sort of, you could say, um, references to which we uh, we look at the idea is basically that you lock property so that it's uh, for the long term uh, secure that uh, communities uh, can and will not uh, speculate uh, with it uh, that for um, those who arrive at the beginning and those who arrive in uh, a number of years basically the same sort of easy access possibilities uh, exist and hopefully we will also be able to build in this sort of snowball mechanism so that uh, you know like uh, different housing communities contribute to the forming of next communities um, at this moment uh, we we are aware that that would be great if we can do it we don't know if we can afford already in the first projects to do that you know to put this leverage on top of the uh, on top of the let's say the rent uh, as a sort of like uh, solidarity uh, uh, 
I would say, solidarity contribution to the next projects. Um, but it's definitely what you are speaking about is the base of what we are, uh, what we are setting up. Um, I, I'd be interested in, as, as you said, yeah, there <clears throat> in Austria also there are a few examples uh, uh, um, kind of uh, in, in the Habitat network or, or similar projects. Um, and um, I mean, there are all great projects. Yesterday also Gabo Heindl talked about uh, Schloa project in Vienna. And uh, well, but um, you can probably count them on one hand or so. It's like, it's a small number. I think I know all of them. And, um, but, but it, I, I mean, this is, I, I, this is interesting and that, uh, I mean, considering the, the problem people face uh, on the housing market and all the inconveniences that you have on the free um, housing market, actually, this is like, it shouldn't be like, it, this would be a mass movement. I mean, I don't really get it why why this isn't like stronger and why don't people uh, like long for alternatives to this hell? Um, and uh, how, how is it uh, in, in your cities or like, is there, is this, I mean, I imagine that there must be also seeing the numbers that, that you showed to us that, I mean, there, there, there must be huge interest in these projects and, and, and stuff. Is it like that or, 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 or is it not so much? Or how, how there is, is that? not yet a huge uh, interest because there is no big visibility uh, and there is no big visibility because there is not yet a real building to, to show it, to prove it. But I think, and, and that, that has been our, poly, let's say our politics uh, has been that we want under circumstances which are very un, unsupportive to develop a project that would make it visible. Uh, and uh, it, in some way, it doesn't matter what it costs, we want to find the finance to make it visible. And once it is visible, then it will become imaginable for people. Then let's say something which they have no reference to becomes an image, becomes a, a, a real, they can go and touch it. They can go and talk with people that live there. They can walk around it. And uh, this is really very important for us. And another thing uh, with, when you say, why is this not a massive movement? Um, I was just today talking on, an, on, a, on another uh, event, which was about informality, uh, uh, informal development. And uh, within this context, I have been presenting actually the development of the housing situation and circumstances of with, uh, let's say, inform informal response to the lack of official housing policy from 1960s on in Belgrade uh, and in Serbia and actually in Yugoslavia. And uh, what we have known in the socialist period as the most, let's say, uh, dominantly as a, as a model of providing housing was the, this uh, societally developed housing, big housing projects, which were of course massive and had covered about 45% of housing uh, and then there was about maybe also 45% of still private housing, but about eight to 10% of housing was cooperatively developed, even in Yugoslav time. And uh, what is interesting is that there was uh, somewhere after 1960s in Yugoslavia, about 1,400 housing cooperatives, which were developing five to 8,000 apartments a year or 10,000 uh, 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 collectively in a collective building apartments a year. So it was big, but there was a support to it. Uh, there was uh, uh, channels, there were channels for finance. There was a channels uh, of getting, uh, let's say affordably land or, uh, or uh, getting the land under good conditions, materials, etc. So this was, let's say a path for people to resolve their housing. But uh, the situation changed very much in the beginning of 2000s uh, when uh, uh, there was a political decision, of course, very neoliberal position, political position uh, that uh, market should resolve everything. And, uh, and at that point, uh, uh, in 2004, foreign banks, and I have to say a lot of Austrian influence was coming to uh, Serbia and many other countries. Uh, and uh, as a pressure from the banks 
saving, uh, saving cooperatives had to be stopped and they have been legally, uh, uh, literally erased from ground. So uh, natural partners for housing cooperatives to, uh, to finance these projects disappeared. And the banks that came, and even Raiffeisen Bank, which is a cooperative in Austria, here operates as a, any commercial bank without any understanding that they should support cooperative movement and not just housing, but anything related to cooperativism. So wherever we knock at the door and say, we are cooperative, we would like to get a, a loan from you. They say, we don't give loans to cooperatives. We don't know to deal with this uh, legal form. We have to check a liability of each individual which is in it and there for them that's for them too much they don't want to go to it and we also don't want to go to checking liability of each individual because that is also not the principle in which cooperative should work but let's say that it, it uh, uh, how do you say um, balances itself by the number sheer number of people in the cooperative and, uh, and, and therefore housing cooperatives actually sort of died out. And that is why we are the first uh, housing cooperative to emerge after 20 years. But also what has changed is the idea of what the cooperative is. Because in, in the Yugoslav period, cooperative was a way to get in the end of the process to privately own apartment that would be your own. And then cooperative is not important anymore. Uh, what we are trying today is to learn lessons from, from that, let's say, and in the context of, of, of this monotonous and at the moment 99% privately owned uh, partners in Belgrade create, let's say, a different possibility for something which is collectively owned, which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, protected from the influences of the market and also safeguard its inhabitants and therefore uh, you cannot own uh, individually an apartment, you can own as a collective the whole apartment building, but then you cannot speculate with it. So it is an, it, it is an interesting switch in what cooperative uh, provided as an alternative 30 years ago, let's say, and what it uh, tries to do today, not just here in Belgrade, but actually with all these mobile members, uh, because the situation is basically the same in all of these countries. Thank you for adding another uh, aspect to um, Austrian uh, neo-colonialism. <laughs> Sorry, this I didn't know that. Um, are there any questions uh, f uh, to the to the two? Otherwise, I'd say thank you very much for the evening and um, and for everything. Um, we uh, there is uh, tomorrow another lecture going on at the same time again at nine in uh, at seven in the evening T tomorrow uh, we will have Ulrich Schachtschneider uh, during the day there is again Utopia uh, Katsutopia school starting at 11 with a seminar by Gabo Heindl um, I wish you a good evening and uh, good luck with the projects and that they will um, thrive and uh, prosper and uh, inspire other people. Um, yeah, and see you another time. Thank you. And we wish you a nice cool breeze. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye.